good then. To net zero. And uh, we're calling it getting it right. I'm Greg and Vita is uh, very capably assisting on the communications front. And um, so we're going to proceed through, I think that we have pretty much the same crew of people from yesterday. And so there's a number of slides here of an in introductory nature that we'll kind of breeze through and then we'll try to get into the, the new material. We're going to do a little bit of review though. So um, you know all about Envira Center from yesterday and our mission and our work and Ener energy services and uh, Carbon 613, our fantastic program for businesses. You know who I am, Greg Furlong, in case you're wondering. Uh, and, but our goals today will be getting into some more of the details on net zero, uh, talking about incentives and the deeper retrofits. And, um, and then we're going to look at some worked out examples at the end. So uh, just as a review of what we did yesterday, um, here's the same picture and uh, the same idea um, and that essentially net zero, I mean, it's not particularly tied to any rating program or anything like that. But the, uh, the concept is just uh, that we're going to have um, our yearly household energy equaling our yearly energy generated. But there is this uh, wonderful program that, that CHBA, the Canadian Home Builders Association has been developing. And uh, so we'll be talking mainly about that program. And, uh, and then this is a look at uh, the results that you get uh, with the three bars, uh, the three sets of bars. We have energy use, CO2 and costs. You can see how those are dramatically reduced with a, a net zero, um, in a net zero situation. So, uh, and then also uh, we're looking at um, obviously getting added value to that out outstanding comfort in these, uh, in these homes. So let's look at uh, some considerations, some other things to consider around uh, getting to net zero. And uh, I know that's an incandescent bulb up there. We're not necessarily heading to that. I guess we can think of ourselves heading away from incandescent bulbs. So first of all, I wanna talk about part nine OBC, uh, Ontario Building Code. And so essentially, um, it just to let people know that this is kind of the kind the, the the sorts of housing that we're talking about. So it's houses and multi-unit residential buildings that satisfy the following. So they're they're not greater than three stories. They um, that's a three stories above grade. Uh, they're not greater than 600 meters squared uh, in footprint, and that means. Uh, or, or you can think of it as almost 6,500 square feet. And that means the, um, the outside uh, perimeter of, of the building as viewed from on top of the building, if you like. Um, it's a bit of a hard uh, thing to explain without kind of looking at a picture, but, um, but uh, we're talking about the footprint here. And uh, very few private homes meet that, uh, that footprint, uh, but um, MERBs certainly do get into that territory. Uh, quite often. It has to be on permanent foundations or it can be also a permanently moored float home. I don't know if anyone has done any net zero float homes yet. Where there is a house that consists of a mix of residential and non-residential, uh, that is, let's say uh, you've got a storefront um, on the main floor and you've got uh, someone living upstairs. The non-residential floor area has to be basically less than half. Um, and uh, the first, uh, yeah, that's basically what this says. The, it, it, uh, you need to, uh, the residential has to be more than half or at least uh, equal to half. And uh, the risk category of, of the non-residential occupancies is acceptable. That means that you can't, uh, let's say, have a welding shop, an active welding shop going downstairs and, um, and do all the things you would need to do uh, to perform an energy evaluation on that building. So that's one example. So it has to be uh, an acceptable situation to actually perform the evaluation. So that's uh, a few things about the, how, how it would fit in there. 
Now uh, let's talk about the added costs for improved construction. So, because what we're talking about here is essentially if you're gonna do a renovation on a house, instead of just doing what you were expecting to do, you're gonna do enough to meet net zero or net zero ready. So what they, the CHBA uh, did do a survey on their, uh, on the first homes that actually qualified under this program uh, or, or were labeled under this program. And um, they found that on average for the net zero ready homes, so that's before you put in the, um, the solar panels, they were only looking at about uh, 15 bucks a square foot extra on average, which amounted to only about 9% added costs for, for actually uh, going to net zero other than, um, rather than uh, going to um, like the basic uh, minimum required by the, the building code. And uh, operating costs were reduced by 35%. So that's, uh, that's pretty good. And you can see uh, a sort of a bell curve here on the responses uh, from the survey. So, uh, so that amounts to, that can amount to cost neutrality when you're looking at lifetime operating costs. These systems all, uh, well, not all, but um, other, everything other than mechanical systems can be expected to last for very long periods of time. So we're looking at this 65% reduction in energy consumption, closing the gas account, because uh, that's often what you will be doing with net zero. Uh, you save your fixed costs of about $285 a year, including um, the taxes, applicable taxes at this point. Uh, you also end up with a safer home with lower insurance costs. So there's some other added values here. Lower operating, operating costs mean also lower risk. Um, I wanted to talk about managing the project and uh, we've created a couple of scenarios here for you. Um, so this would be your typical stepped uh, upgrades. And, and what we're looking at here is, let's say that these, these series of upgrades take place over a period of five years in this, uh, in this instance. So, uh, so we're starting on the left with uh, air sealing and ventilating, and we're ending up uh, installing our solar PV at the end. It kind of works its way from the, the least expensive to the most expensive. So, um, they, they start, start with cost effective upgrades and use the savings to pay for other upgrades. So, you, so you're generally starting with building envelope first. I wanted to just, um, after looking at this in detail, I wanted to just discuss what this amounts to. Um, it may not be the best approach because it does, if over that, peri that five year period, you're gonna get smaller, total energy savings, you're gonna get smaller carbon reductions, and you're gonna get smaller dollar savings. So I don't recommend using this step scenario unless you're uh, financially strapped. What I would recommend doing instead is um, what I would call a more effective strategy for net zero. And uh, here's the same graph because we're gonna have another one to compare it with. And um, so we will instead cut to the chase. We'll start with the upgrades that have immediate significant impact on energy use and carbon production like air source heat pump and solar PV. Because uh, you know, in our uh, present uh, global climate, uh, you know, what are we looking for? What do we want? We want carbon reductions. And when do we want them? We want them as soon as possible. So, um, so we, we would want to uh, adopt a, a strategy that uh, starts reducing the carbon as soon as possible, uh, given that it's not gonna uh, create an, a, a difficult situation for us. So it, when you compare this uh, to the stepped plan, um, this other strategy has, uh, over that period of time, had 50 56% less energy use. In this particular instance, um, it was 740 gigajoules 60% less carbon production, which amounted to 33 tons, and almost $10,000 in extra cash that, that resulted. And the reason for that is because you put in the solar panels right away. They are expensive, but the longer you wait to put them in, uh, means that, uh, th that they won't be producing, um, th th they're only gonna start producing electricity at the point you, that you put them in. So if you wait, uh, then you're not gonna get the electricity that they can produce. 
so um, and note that the, the total cost of upgrades was the same in both cases here. So if the financing can be arranged uh, and you're going to do these five upgrades anyway over a period of time, it's best to start with the high impact upgrades and then work your way towards the, the other ones over time. And this is a workable scenario um, uh, as uh, we will discuss a little bit uh, further along as well. So um, I wanted to talk about base loads, which are end up being an important factor in, in um, uh, net zero modeling and, and actually realizing net zero. And base loads are basically the amount of energy that you use on an ongoing basis. So it's, um, it's energy used within the house uh, it, for various things. And within the various rating systems, it's treated as kind of a fixed value. Uh, and what Enercan, uh, Natural Resources Canada did was they surveyed uh, people nationwide. They surveyed and they, they came up with uh, some, some numbers for what they could expect as an average uh, for base loads. And, and we, we need to use, we're kind of, um, we, we, uh, we need to use those, those values when we're modeling. So, uh, so typically when we look at older housing, we would be looking at a picture, something like this. The blue section of the pie is the heating. So in this case, it's uh, 65%. Uh, the domestic hot water, the DHW, that's uh, your, um, your water heater, and it's uh, 16%. So those two contribute just over 80%. So we're left with less than 20% of the total being the base loads. So uh, it was, you know, base loads were uh, be, be considered a fairly small amount of the total. However, uh, and, there's, and that's kind of what your piece of the pie looks like. Uh, when we go to net zero, then we're looking at more than 50%. Uh, then the reason is that the base loads have stayed pretty much the same, but we've reduced our heating and our domestic hot water energy dramatically. And, uh, and so, you know, what the effect is that this has on your attempts to get the net zero is that it, it tends to limit your, your further energy reductions. At a certain point, it's very, very hard to get past a certain threshold. Uh, and it means that you're devoting, uh, you know, it, it, you're devoting half of your solar uh, photovoltaic cells are actually there just to generate electricity for your base loads. And um, the base loads uh, can affect, uh, well, will affect your summertime AC loads because they're internal loads in your, in your building and they're producing heat. Every watt of energy that you consume within the house is uh, being converted to heat ultimately and your air conditioner um, it, it's going to heat up your, your house in the summer as well as the winter and uh, you're going to end up with um, having to do something about that. Um, HOT 2000 does allow a slight reduction in the base loads when, uh, when you're approaching net zero. Uh, so we can reduce them slightly uh, to help, uh, help reach that, that target. But um, by and large, uh, it still remains a large part of the, of the pie for these uh, net zero homes. Just uh, wanted to introduce you to that angle of things uh, that we see from the modeling perspective. So um, I wanted to talk about uh, what we've talked about so far with uh, CHBA net zero. Um, we've been talking about the, the net zero program as it was launched uh, for new homes. And uh, so well over, well, it's, yeah, over 265 homes have, have been labeled to date. Um, and there has been one, uh, this is what I heard a couple of weeks ago, um, there's been one renovation so far that's been uh, rated. But in order to meet that uh, standard, it would need to meet all the other conditions that a new home would need to re meet, which turns out to be quite difficult once you've got the house once you have the house already built. So uh, yeah, renos are also eligible at this point if they meet the same requirements as new homes. But the CHBA is now working on a, on a tailored uh, program for renovations to existing homes for net zero. And um, this program will mirror the existing 
program that will have some uh, some elements that are going to make it easily e more easy to apply to uh, the the renovation uh, situation. Now, I just uh, wanted to note that uh, as it, this is something that the CHBA wanted to reinforce that it is in reference to net zero energy. That is to, that is as opposed to net zero carbon. And and uh, this is something that we talked about. These slides are part were partly provided by the CHBA for this uh, presentation, so we've just edited them slightly. And uh, here's what their timeline is for this program. Um, we're coming kind of coming to the end of year one uh, because it's it's supposed to go to March 2020. Um, so this is the uh, they're finalizing their uh, technical and, and admin requirements. Year two, which is to start shortly, um, is to launch a pilot uh, program. Now, if any of you are planning to do a net zero retrofit, this would be a great time to get involved uh, and to uh, you know contact um, uh, an SO such as uh, Enviro Center and uh, and see if you can you can get on board uh, for being part of the pilot program. And they're going to uh, come up with a um, the CHB renovator manual. And in year three, they're going to launch version one. So they're going to actually launch the, the, uh, the official labeling program. So that'll be um, starting about a year from now. So I just thought I would let you know about that coming program, which is uh, going to be starting very soon. And uh, you can also contact uh, them directly. And uh, this, is, this will be in the slide presentation uh, that we sent to you as well. So you can get that information from that. All right, I wanted to talk, given that uh, we, um, we're kind of in a certain situation right now that um, we don't have a, a tailored retrofit program, there might be some situations where you can't actually, uh, or it becomes very prohibitively expensive to reach these, um, these targets uh, for CHBA. So uh, in this situation, you can still reach net zero uh, so here's um, when you when you can't reach it. There, there here's an 80s house. Uh, it's actually um, a row house. A great example here. So at the top, uh, you can see um, the CHBA upgrade energy use was 32.4 gigajoules, and at the bottom, um, this was without doing all the uh, incorporating all the elements that would be necessary uh, under the existing program. Uh, it's, it ends up being two more gigajoules uh, in terms of the, um, the energy use. So, and uh, the unlabeled version did not include upgrades to external walls and did not include the basement uh, slab being uh, insulated to R5. So they were, um, they were essential parts of the uh, CHBA program, but uh, they were not uh, implemented in this case. And, um, and so, uh, but, but we were still able to reach net zero. And, uh, but, but uh, what uh, the results are is that um, you have higher energy use, uh, obviously. Uh, we had that extra two gigajoules in this case. You were gonna need more solar panels to make up for that. Uh, you've got a bigger carbon footprint potentially. And um, there is no net zero ready rating at all for that program. Like say you, you, you got to that, you wouldn't get any, any, um, any uh, prizes for just getting down to 34 gigajoules other than knowing that your house uh, just uses a small amount of energy. Um, and then obviously you can't apply a net zero label to that presently. Uh, hopefully we'll, we, we will be able to do that uh, with the new CHBA program. And uh, this is just showing the label that you could apply at this point. Uh, you would get um, an Energuide uh, uh, label and, uh, and it would say that uh, this house uses zero energy per year. So uh, there is uh, some recognition for that, but not, um, uh, not under the CHBA program at this point uh, for these, uh, for these uh, uh, retrofits that don't absolutely meet uh, the other requirements. Um, I wanted to stop and ask if there are any questions at this point. There are, Greg. There are quite a few, actually. Okay. So, first question comes from Christopher. Uh, how would a hard connected barbecue affect net, net zero, seeing as that would also require the gas account? 
Uh, well, uh, you, um, you know, it, you could keep the garb, the, uh, the gas barbecue. Um, it, it probably uses a fairly small amount of gas uh, and, but uh, it would have to be somehow um, factored in. I wouldn't recommend keeping it. I mean, there are other ways you can go with that. Um, and, uh, you know, the way that we're going with, with this, with net zero and so on, um, one thing I didn't talk about was uh, we haven't been talking about net zero carbon. Uh, natural gas in, right now in Ontario uses 10 times, it produces 10 times the amount of, of greenhouse gases per, per uh, unit of energy. So uh, we should be steering clear, uh, that is compared to electricity. So we should be steering clear of, uh, of combustion if at all possible and using electricity uh, instead. Um, obviously uh, a small amount is not gonna make uh, a, a big, uh, is, not, is gonna be like a drop in the bucket, but, um, uh, and, and if, you're, if you're just keeping your gas account open just for the barbecue, you're, you just bear in mind you're paying $285 just to keep that account open uh, for, the, for the few times that you're gonna use it. So something to consider, you might wanna go to, uh, you know, propane instead, for example, um, not that, uh, you know, again, we're burning things, but um, it would probably save you a bit of cash uh, anyway. I hope that uh, answers your, your question. It's, uh, it, it basically opens a discussion. Okay. Uh, there's another question from Christopher, then, then there are a couple of others from other people as well. Uh, do LED lights lower the base load for electrical requirements and heat? Uh, okay, uh, yes, they do. They can, um, if, you, if you get close to, to net zero, um, then uh, we can, we can uh, factor in uh, such things as LED lighting and, and so on, yes. Um, so the, the answer is, uh, is essentially yes. It, yes, you can factor them in um, as long as uh, you get close to, uh, to net zero, then we can start factoring them in. Within about five gigajoules of, uh, of zero, we can start factoring those in. Okay, then um, Marianne has a question that is to do with um, some of the graphs that you were showing. So she explains that she works with social financing lenders to have low interest loans available for retrofits. Um, what would you say is the sweet spot for an interest rate that would still make your second graph appealing to customers? Or more simply stated, do you have an estimated ROR for the second scenario over a 10 year period or so? Uh, I haven't worked that out. I had been working out some of these financial uh, aspects, but uh, I haven't particularly worked out that one. I basically would need to work through a few different examples to see where um, where they typically land in terms of, um, of costing. Uh, so no, I don't have that worked out, but uh, I would welcome your participation uh, with EnviroCenter to, uh, to come up with some numbers on this because um, it, it would really seems like it's, it's the way to go and uh, if you look at the numbers. So, uh, so yes, uh, we, we, it'd be great to discuss it further with you. I just, um, I unmuted myself to comment on that without blogging down the chat, but um, it, it, we're essentially trying to localize a PACE program without it being an official PACE program. For sure. Through a social financing lender. Um, and we, obviously the lender is, has the interest of having an interest rate that's slightly higher or less competitive where like we are obviously looking at it being next to nothing to make it more of a um, ideal payback period for the customer. But, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, it uh, it's going to depend on a lot of factors here. <clears throat> we're we're basically uh, we have highly developed technologies at this point, uh, like established technologies like solar panels and heat pumps, but the the costs of these elements are still fairly high, and that's partly because they're not widely adopted. Um, so. Uh, and but the costs have been going down at a at a pretty good rate. So it, it's it, it's hard to um, it, 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 there's a lot of different factors that need to be taken into account. But uh, right now it it's it we're looking at rather long paybacks, um, it, uh, you know, in kind of in, in the 20 year range. 
Um, but you know, those could quickly, uh, you know, come come back to the ten-year range if the costs go down. So it it, it certainly it it it's too big a, a something uh, of something to really get into much of a discussion today. But uh, you know, I think if we if you want, uh, we I will provide you with uh, our contact info and we can continue this discussion further. Sure. Um, part two of that question might be faster, and it was, um, do you know if there is a anyone looking into um, rough square footage or age of home with rough full cost for a retrofit of like to net, net zero standard? And obviously every house is different, but is there some kind of um, chart or anything that you've seen that has a, a table that could kind of be like, if you have a home built in the 80s that's x amount of square feet um you're probably looking at whatever i um, i i don't know if anyone has done that depth uh, analysis perhaps the chba is, is doing that since they are looking at at launching this this uh this uh, other uh, labeling system mm -hmm. uh we will be looking at it a little bit more uh, later in this presentation okay thank you okay you're welcome is that it for now or uh, should we? Yeah, I think that's it for now. Okay, thanks for your input, everyone. Uh, so we're, we're gonna look at these incentives. Now, unfor unfortunately, within our jurisdiction, um, the uh, incentives for clean energy, is particularly under the present administration, are, are quite uh, small, but the following are still active here in Ontario. Um, and this is a, a federal program. The CMHC Green Home Program offers about uh, offers a 25% up to 25% rebate on mortgage insurance premiums. So that would apply in the case of uh, uh, you know obviously um, uh, on on more in the case of if you were looking to get a mortgage. Um, and this is uh, the table that they have here. Uh, if you, for example, if your pre-retrofit rating was lower than 200, which uh, for the most part they are, then you would need to decrease your rating by 45 gigajoules per year. So it's too bad that, it, that it's not more of a sliding scale because if you're already, let's say at 60 um, or 70 gigajoules per year, then it's pretty hard to get uh, to decrease by 45 and to get and to capitalize on that. Um, so uh, you you might want to check out their website to see if there's another rule that would apply at, at that point. Um, the, and uh, Genworth Energy Efficient Housing Program has the same rules as CMHC Green Home. I don't know about the with the details behind the scenes, but it, it appears that another other a number of other programs are are piggybacking on this or mimicking uh, the, this uh, this program. Um, Enbridge does offer a, um, a home efficiency rebate uh, for residential properties. Uh, but uh, bear in mind, they are a, a gas, natural gas uh, company primarily. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's for natural gas users only. And uh, it doesn't apply to multi-unit residential buildings at this point. There also is, uh, which may, maybe is a little bit more appealing, depending on your situation, uh, there is a, a tax provision for um, installing uh, solar uh, energy uh, equipment and also heat recovery equipment. Uh, so if you're uh, in a situation where you can take advantage of that, um, there's a capital cost allowance rate of 100% that, that is applied. So uh, you could talk to your accountant about that and see if that might be uh, what that would amount to in, in your situation, whether that, uh, that would um, particularly help your, uh, your situation in terms of upgrades. In terms of multi-unit residential buildings, if any of you uh, have um, these properties, they, are, uh, they can be eligible for commercial incentives. Uh, for example, um, the, uh, the IESO, which in, in, in this case, you would be going through uh, Hydro Ottawa. Um, they have the Save on Energy Retrofit Program, uh, which offers substantial in incentives for electrical savings. So they, they will cover up to 50% of project costs for some situations, for example. And there's a link there uh, for them that we will provide to you. Uh, Enbridge Smart Savings is, is very similar, but it's for savings that affect gas use instead of electricity use. 
Um, uh, once again, uh, they are a, a gas company, so it's for continuing gas users only. And beware of lock-in, uh, which means that um, beware of investing in equipment that you may, you may find is uh, becoming obsolete over time. And, um, and then the, the same federal tax provision for clean energy equipment, uh, as mentioned on the previous slide. So that, that's, all, that's all I have for you. If you have other, um, I mean, uh, some incentives are coming and going all the time. If you have other ones, uh, please uh, let us know and uh, we'll incorporate them into future, um, uh, future uh, slides. And, yeah, Greg, uh, you know, sorry to interrupt. Somebody just mentioned that there's some talk related to Ottawa's climate change master plan. That oh, there yes. may be incentives from them. Have you heard anything? Yes, there is. So, okay, yeah. So there's lots of talk of incentives, including with the federal government, but nothing has actually um, come out at this point. So I, I don't really want to say too much about that because uh, we have been disappointed in the past. And, but uh, but it, it, if we want to get moving on this, um, it does make sense uh, for society uh, in, the, in the long run to, to go in this direction. So I don't see why they would not be providing these kinds of incentives. And also they, um, they contribute enormously to the local economy for, uh, for retrofits. So uh, yeah, but I have nothing uh, concrete to offer on that front. All right, uh, so we'll, uh, we'll carry on here. Uh, so retrofitting to success. So uh, here's some key elements of a uh, net zero retrofit. So first of all, don't get too tied into one particular way of doing things. Keep, um, keep an open mind. Always be considering the energy balance. Uh, so um, exterior changes to your house may be necessary or your building, bear that in mind. Uh, when designing, if you're taking part in the CHBA net zero home labeling program, then you need to also follow those specifications. You wanna consult with the energy advisor because they will be an expert in that area and, um, and they will uh, look at, uh, and they're the ones to talk to about anything that, that affects your heating, ventilating, air conditioning, or the exterior of the house, especially, or the exterior, what I'm talking about by exterior here, I mean the building envelope uh, of the house, the, the part that separates you uh, from the, um, the elements. Figure out your heating system last. So don't go into it thinking I'm gonna have in-floor heating uh, or I'm gonna put in, I don't know, a solar, um, it, a solar water heating uh, system that's gonna heat my house. Just uh, maybe hold off on those kinds of plans until you see what else, uh, what it actually would be best suited to your particular situation. And, uh, and listen to your, um, your energy advisor and other third party independent uh, advice uh, on, on, along those lines. Choose contractors with training in building science and also test your air leakage before it's too late to fix. So you wanna, uh, you wanna get uh, your air leakage tested before you start your retrofit and maybe have some, someone come in and, uh, and help you identify those air leaks and to make sure you're on track to hitting your air leakage targets. So we're going to just break those out a little bit. Um, you know, the best upgrades are not always obvious. Uh, ventilation and comfort need to be carefully considered uh, and by experts. Uh, and uh, you know, energy modeling is is really valuable because it takes in the effect of each energy use, engages the energy balance, and it's your best guide to upgrade impacts. And as an example here, here's a house that uh, rated zero. This is a look at one of the uh, sections inside Hot 2000. Um, and uh, the reason that it's net zero is that uh, the, the amount that's consumed by the house is, uh, is 40, uh, just over uh, 40 gigajoules, almost 41. And your electricity generation is uh, almost 43. So you've got a, a little bit of excess electricity generation. And so that, will, that drives your, your rating down to zero. And I just wanted to mention that just above the total AEC there at the bottom is the, the base loads. And you can see that that's, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, it's more than 50% of the, of the total in this case. It's 22 as, as compared to 41 uh, gigajoules. So um, once again, decide on the type of heating system that bet best fits your picture. So always keep this energy balance in mind. Um, 
you know, all the energy use needs to be offset by recovery or generation. So uh, your HVAC, um, which depends on your building envelope, uh, is um, your appliances, entertainment and other household use, your lighting, all that has to be offset by, um, you know, what heating or cooling energy that you can recapture or reuse and, uh, and by how much energy you can generate on your property. So consider making exterior changes. In this case, uh, they, the siding was being replaced and so it was stripped down and, uh, and then it was all done from the exterior. Uh, it might be the most effective way to upgrade your walls or foundation. Um, consult with the energy advisor. So uh, you, you will wanna, uh, if there's anything that affects the HVAC or the building envelope, you wanna consult with them. They will be the best guide as to um, what directions you could go. And, uh, and they will have usually several options to offer. Figure out your heating system last, and um, we will discuss the heat pumps a little bit later in, in depth. Um, but uh, the, the sizing and the distribution are important. Uh, you need to choose appropriate technology. Just beware of manufacturer and installer claims of comfort and efficiency. Uh, so that's where you would wanna have that third party in advice. And also bear in mind that sometimes efficiency gains don't outweigh the added costs. If you have to uh, you know, pay four times as much for a, uh, a very small percentage improvement, then um, you would wanna weigh those and see whether it makes sense to, to go for that efficiency improvement. So hire contractors with training in building science. This is another table from the CHBA study. And, um, and what they found uh, was uh, education was the biggest challenge for, for most projects in the CHBA study. So the, the advantage with having trained, trained contractors is they will understand why you're doing it this way. Uh, so you're not gonna have to constantly justify your decisions. And they may actually come up with better ideas. Uh, and, uh, and so, you, you know, if you're open to those, you may actually find some shortcuts and uh, things, some things that will uh, save you money and, um, and achieve your goals more easily. The pre-drywall blower door test was also, they also surveyed for this. And, um, you know, the, the most uh, contractors, uh, most builders felt that the benefits outweigh the cost because the risk of not meeting your target is too high not to do a pre-drywall air test. Now, bear in mind that these were done with new builds, uh, but still uh, the same uh, would apply for any retrofit situation. Are there any questions on all of that? Yes, Greg, there are. Oh, I can just imagine. <laughs> well, actually, there are a couple of things that are to do with the incentives that comments that just came through. Okay. Um, so Stefan, I believe is his name, uh, said that the Liberals have promised an incentives for retrofits up to 40,000 interest free loan, $40,000. Yes, that's right. Yeah, the expectation was for this to be released with the budget, but with the cost of the coronavirus, um, this may no longer be the case. That's correct. And, Thank you, yeah. Stefan. Yeah, that, and that's, somebody that's else a good summary. Christopher from uh, GOBA uh, mentions that they've been concerned that the city might go with punitive options as opposed to incentives, which would be unfortunate, was the comment. Um, and then I think this is more to do with the, the information that you were just sharing now. Does the embedded carbon in the brick or the cost of its disposal ever factor in? Yes, and so that's a really good question. I was toying whether I should get into that in this presentation, and then I, I figured that I had enough to talk about as it was. Uh, but we're not at this point talking about embodied energy, um, but it, that obviously is um, and can be a big factor, especially when you're looking at materials that are produced from uh, fossil fuels, such as um, uh, a lot of the, the board insulation materials and so on. Um, and concrete is, uh, is also a good example. Um, some of these building materials require enormous amounts of energy to produce. 
And um, you probably heard these numbers um, that uh, in some cases, the amount of energy used to produce the building materials is more than the amount of energy that the, that the house will consume over its lifetime. And, uh, and I guess that becomes more and more relevant the less energy that you, that you produce. So obviously you would, um, you, you would wanna consider that at this point, it's not in uh, a primary concern, but I'm sure it will become a bigger concern um, very soon. It may be in the next iteration of this, of this program. Cool, that was it. Oh, wait, um, ideally the brick could be crushed and used in gardens as mulch, but that type of, type of machine is not ready available. I, what, don't we have sledgehammers? That was just meant as a joke, but uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, I, um, yeah, brick is actually, you know, relatively soft uh, compared to some other uh, masonry products. You could uh, smash it up somehow. Uh, anyway, um, we'll just to carry on here with the installation. Um, so uh, just uh, we're going to talk about, we're not going to, uh, I'm, I'm not going to tell you how to build the house because probably a lot of you know a lot more about it than I do. But I will deal with uh, kind of the bigger picture and, uh, and then we can discuss some of the other stuff. I, I do know more about some of these other details, but again, can't get into it too much. Um, so just on construction materials and techniques, uh, just bear in mind that um, for the CHBA program in particular, uh, additions and other new construction should exceed uh, the, the building code, or at least it should meet the, the building, the existing building code. Um, and, but uh, especially in attention uh, to the air barrier and insulating values of, um, of, the, of uh, construction materials. So looking at the CHBA technical requirements, um, if you look at the right, uh, you'll see the table um, here in Ottawa, where our, our climate is 4,500 metric uh, heating degree days. Um, so we fall in, in, in that range. And so this are, these are the, the R values and the RSI values um, in, uh, that are laid out here. Oh my God, the phone's ringing. Okay, just uh, wait, on, hang on for a moment here. Okay, we'll carry on. Uh, so uh, bear in mind that these are effective, not nominal values. And to any of you who don't understand what that means, it means that they are the, the R values that are, that are calculated when you look at the entire construction of those elements of the building. So, um, so not just the insulation, but factoring in all the, uh, all the construction elements like the wood, uh, the, um, the plaster, uh, well, uh, the gypsum, uh, the drywall, um, uh, uh, the um, siding, a brick, uh, and uh, other th uh, thermal bridging elements such as uh, masonry that might, that might go through or, or anything else that uh, is, is coming through. So these are the effect of our values. Um, and uh, so we'll talk about those a little bit later, but uh, if you wanna note, uh, actually, we'll, we'll get into them uh, later on. I, I do have them tabulated in each, uh, each element as we go along here. Also uh, looking at the air tightness uh, side of things, um, 1.5 air changes per hour at 50 pascals, um, which is the same as uh, that used for R2000. Uh, in, it, in attached homes, it, uh, the, um, the standard is, uh, is actually um, a little bit easier, well, not necessarily easier to reach, but uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's two air, air changes per hour at 50 pascals. And, um, and also there are other ways of meeting that uh, in, in terms of the NLA or NLR in the table at the, at the right. Um, other elements would be that the HRV needs to be balanced and the forced air ductwork must be sealed. So, uh, you know, in particular, the, um, the ductwork uh, would be maybe an issue with a, uh, if an existing home, if you're not planning to um, uh, redo the ductwork. You, there is, uh, there are uh, sealing materials that you can use uh, at this point uh, to do that, but um, the, uh, you know, it, it, it would, would certainly um, change. The, the approach needs to be carefully considered anyway. 
Um, technical requirements on the solar photovoltaics, they must, uh, whoever's uh, in, in, in uh, installing these, the, the builder renovator has to calculate the production following Entercan's procedures and um, the specified design, uh, the dimensions and, and all the specifications have to reflect the specified design. Um, important considerations are that uh, you would want to calculate the maximum kilowatt hour expected capacity of the array as soon as possible. And that is uh, if you want to make, a, if you want to install your high impact, uh, if you want to get your, your solar array in as soon as possible, then you, you would want to figure out what you want to have at the end of the day um, uh, installed. So uh, get an, a site assessment as soon as possible as well. And um, that would be performed by uh, a qualified solar installer. And uh, they would be able to tell, uh, you know, whether the site is, uh, what modifications would need to be made to the site or whether it's actually uh, appropriate for the size uh, size of array that you're thinking of putting in. And um, obviously install early for immediate savings as I discussed earlier. Heating and cooling. Uh, so the answer is usually air source heat pumps for net zero. Uh, just because of the way the numbers work out, it's not, uh, it's not specified by um, the Canadian Home Builders Association, but it is well matched to this application. There's small heating and cooling loads. These are extremely efficient. They are relatively low cost to operate. They only use electricity and they're now effective in colder climates like Ottawa. They can also run with combustion backup if desired. So you can keep your, your combustion uh, furnace uh, for a while and you may still hit your net zero target. And then uh, when, the, um, when the system expires, then you can, uh, you can replace it with something else. So uh, install uh, the heat pump uh, as early as possible because you get big greenhouse gas savings in Ontario, even if they're undersized. So if, you, if you were, you're putting in a 36,000 BTU air, con um, well, air source heat pump, and uh, your present heating load is, um, let's say 50,000 BTU uh, per hour, then uh, if you put that in right away, it's already going to contribute in, in, a, in a great way. Uh, and as you lower um, the uh, heating requirements of your house, it's just going to continue to, uh, to, to create a better and better situation. In other words, you don't have to have it perfectly matched to begin with uh, when you install it, uh, as long as you know where you're heading. And um, your energy advisor and your HVAC contractor will provide the equipment size and that will be appropriate to your final plan. Keep, and as I said, keep your existing uh, heating system as backup until the, it uh, comes to its end of life. Attics and other ceilings under the CHBA program have to meet um, an effective R value of 49. And you can usually reach that with R60 cellulose, which would be about 17 inches. Um, in some cases, vertical space may be a problem. Uh, if you've got a low sloped roof, uh, as you get towards the eaves, uh, you may find that you're running out of space and that it, uh, it will have some impact on the, the, um, the effect of R value. Um, Meeting the, the standard for flat roofs or cathedral ceilings is uh, R26.5, which is a little bit lower, um, but uh, it's not any easier to meet because uh, these areas uh, can be uh, difficult to upgrade. So um, you would want to get, you would want to consult with someone to find out what the most effective way was of reaching that standard if that's what you're aiming for. You, you can fill, let's say uh, you have, if you have framed cavities, let's say typically you've got, um, uh, let's say two by tens or two by, uh, two by some large dimension, 12s or maybe even eights um, up uh, under the flat roof. Uh, you could fill those cavities with more fiber insulation, but that may create problems uh, for uh, if you ever have any water leaks or maybe create some problems for uh, venting and so on. Um, so uh, a better approach may be to add a continuous layer on the rooftop uh, and that would be, the exterior would be preferred um, in, uh, to deal with the dew point uh, situation, et cetera. 
Uh, but that could be scheduled when re-roofing. If you're going to be doing re-roofing, uh, it could be a, a, a great opportunity to, um, to make essentially the roof, uh, the outer, uh, the, the layer that, that uh, defines the, um, your building envelope. Uh, wall insulation. So um, if you want to meet this requirement of 17.5, if you have uh, if you have four inch walls, if you have two by four walls, you have to add at least R6. Now, I looked at the numbers on this. Uh, and if you have uh, six inch walls, you have to add R1. Uh, they, are, they come close to R17.5, but usually they, they don't meet, meet it as an effective R value. So um, the... Um, I, I wanted to, to just stress that uh, if you're thinking of taking out the insulation in your walls and saying, well, I've only got R12 in there, now I'm going to upgrade to uh, R14, or I'm going to put in um, spray foam in all my wall cavities. Uh, by and large, that uh, re removal and replacement of insulation is ineffective because of the thermal bridging, because you still have a lot of lumber that's uh, it's bridging in between those cavities and, and you don't get the R values that you're expecting uh, from that approach. So uh, you, you uh, in the case of six inch walls, you would probably reach it, but it would be an, a really expensive upgrade if you're gonna fill those six inch walls with, um, with uh, spray foam, for example. So um, exterior is, uh, is preferred. Uh, you can, uh, rather than uh, in, uh, installing board insulation on the interior, um, it's better to install it on the exterior, and I won't get into that right now, but uh, you can find a, a numerous resources that will explain why that is preferred. Uh, in terms of materials, board insulation, almost any type, uh, but there are some types that will have lower um, embodied energy. Uh, so you, it, on that front, you can certainly go in that direction. Unfortunately, they tend to have slightly lower R values as well. You would, doing it on the outside does actually uh, create uh, a, uh, an opportunity to have a, make a big dent in your air leakage because you can add a continuous air barrier at this time. You would also take advantage of the opportunity to install your window upgrades and to upgrade the flashing as necessary around those elements. There are some commercial wall systems that are available. Um, I saw uh, a, a couple of uh, instances where this was done in the far north. Um, there's, and, and there's a couple of links here. That illustration on the left is from um, IS 3000, uh, which I, I now I forget whether that is, I think that's, uh, I, I, can't, I can't remember whether that's Energy Wall or, or Atlas. But uh, basically, it's an exterior insulation product that is um, has been engineered for this particular use, and uh, and as you can see in this situation, they've also gone under the floor uh, with it because this is a a, a building that's up on um, on posts. Uh, foundations. So uh, this is uh, an illustration from keeping the heat in. Um, but I thought it was uh, a, a good one for what we're going to talk about here. So first of all, upgrading the foundation requires expert advice. Uh, any water leakage has to be resolved first. If you have poured concrete, that's great because it tends to be very stable uh, once you've got the water res issues resolved. Concrete block uh, for, um, for interior insulation is usually okay, uh, but you can run into problems. Uh, if it's stone or rubble, you really have to proceed with, with caution and exterior insulation is the best approach uh, for a number of reasons. Um, the first uh, is that uh, the rubble tends to have a lot of moisture content and, it, and allowing it to then freeze or to freeze to a larger extent in the winter may make the foundation un unstable in some way. The second one is that if you insulate on the inside of a two foot thick uh, foundation wall, when, when your walls above grade are only about six inches thick, then you end up with a, a one and a half band, one and a half foot band of, of uninsulated uh, floor around the perimeter and that often creates a, a, a situation with these older houses. So um, 
there are numerous reasons, suffice it to say, uh, to, uh, to insulate on the exterior. Uh, if you want to meet the CHBA requirement of 16.9, uh, one possible interior approach would be two by four framing with a three inch gap off the uh, foundation wall and to use R20 bats in that, um, in that situation. In other words, those, uh, those bats uh, are only partly within the framing. The, the back part of them actually extends beyond and uh, forms a more or less continuous layer. Uh, beyond the framing, uh, between the framing and the and the uh, foundation wall. Um, if you're putting on exterior board or foam insulation, uh, that is the best energy approach actually in most situations, but especially with stone, it does add uh, you know potentially uh, four inches thickness. Uh, it can be continuous with your exterior wall insulation. Let's let's say in this case you are adding exterior insulation. Now you can have that blended in with the with the part that goes below grade, and uh, but uh, you know excavation is usually necessary and is usually expensive. Although uh, you could probably use slot trenching rather than uh, a backhoe, uh, and that would probably be a more effective way of of doing it. Um, the skirts, and this is what I've why I included this illustration. They could be effective here, but they're not currently approved, as far as I can tell by the CHBA uh, program. And um, you know, for these kinds of situations, uh, they, may, they would possibly make more sense uh, where you, could, you only have to excavate a little bit below grade and then put in a skirt and, uh, and then uh, keep the frost away from the lower part of the foundation that way. Oh yes, I also wanted to mention that there is a requirement for the basement floor uh, under the uh, the, CB, the CHBA program uh, for R5 on the on this slab. Windows and doors, on, in terms of quality, um, under the Net Zero labeling program, uh, they they have to be Energy Star qualified for the climates on which they're installed. But if you have decorative windows, that would be like side lights and that kind of thing. Um, they don't need to comply, but they have to be at least double glazed. And as long as the total uh, number of decorative windows is less than 15% of your total glazing, um, one door need not, um, need not comply. For example, you might have a very fancy wooden door in the front. Um, it could uh, stay as it was and uh, you would upgrade uh, all the other doors. In terms of window placement, as a, just as a general, um, general advice, uh, you want to reduce the, the north facing windows uh, and beware of excessive south and west facing. Uh, so the first one, uh, because they're, um, they're going to be losing heat. Uh, and the second one, because uh, they may be gaining excessive heat. So you need to be strategic with your window placement. That, uh, that's what I meant to uh, convey here. Air leakage. So um, most older houses are four air changes per hour or more uh, at 50 pascals. Uh, deep reductions are necessary to reach 1.5 ACH 50. So um, air leakage testing will tell you where and how much. For example, EnviroCenter does offer that kind of service. We have uh, lower, lower door testing equipment. So, uh, and infrared uh, detection. So uh, that would, uh, we can certainly uh, help um, locate the leaks and quantify them. Blower door guided sealing is also possible. So that would be um, the, the air sealing is taking place at the same time as some kind of blower door testing. Uh, so you can, uh, you can do, you can see what kind of progress you're making while you're doing the, the air sealing. The classic uh, locations for, for big air leaks are not, uh, I mean, there are all the small ones, the trim around windows and, and uh, you know, electrical outlets and so on, but the big ones uh, are often, uh, let's say, side attics in a half story situation, overhanging floors, split walls, if you've got a split, um, if you have a split level, uh, you know, situations like that where there end up being very large openings that are going into unconditioned spaces. Um, so you want to air seal all the gaps, cracks, and openings, and it's not necessarily only going to be with a caulking gun. In, in, some, in, in the, the most effective cases, it's going to be with pieces of blocking material or, uh, or air barrier material. You want to weather strip your doors and windows, obviously, and, uh, and to update the weather stripping on a regular basis. 
And the added benefits of uh, air leakage are your, your comfort, humidity control, and uh, health and safety when you have a, a attached garages and so on and, and those other spaces. If you're above a welding shop, you wanna have good uh, air sealing. Vapor transmission, I just wanted to say something about this. Um, this is just a general uh, discussion. Um, you know, uh, just in general, uh, we have been used to talking about vapor barriers and it's that piece of plastic that you find underneath the drywall in your house. But by and large, I think uh, the way that we're uh, approaching this now is we're, think we're treating that as a vapor retarder because we've, we've determined that it's more important to keep the air from moving through the building envelope um, than have, um, a, you know, a, a absolute uh, vapor, um, a, an absolute uh, vapor uh, barrier. So uh, the, the problem is that the moist air gets into cold areas and then the water condenses. That's really the, the essence of the problem. And the best control to, do, to control that uh, is to reduce your air leakage through the building envelope. Um, if you're installing your board insulation, you want to install it on the warm side of, uh, sorry, this is, it should be the, the, the reverse here. The, the board insulation should be on the cold side of the fiber insulation. So you have the one third, two thirds rule. Uh, and the vapor retarder, um, just bear in mind that it only prevents direct vapor diffusion it's continuous, but it can be unsealed uh, unless it's also the air barrier. So if you're depending on the vapor, vapor barrier to do, or the vapor retarder to do everything, then it does actually need to be very tightly air sealed. But these days, uh, especially in new construction, we're tending to go with um, having an air barrier on the outside and then uh, having a vapor retarder on the inside. Okay. Um, Ventilation, so with all this air sealing, uh, we need to have provide adequate ventilation uh, under the CHBA program. You have to have balanced ventilation with heat recovery that's be capable of meeting the principal ventilation airflow rate and installed so that the supply and exhaust are, are balanced within 10% at high speed. And, uh, and there's a label attached, it needs to be a label attached for that. So that's a similar requirement to R2000. HRVs and ERVs serving residential units shall be, well, uh, they are mostly, um, it's hard to find one that isn't certified by the HVI. Um, and they also uh, could be ENERGY STAR qualified instead. And, uh, and the table shows um, the, the kinds of flow rates that you would want to aim for, uh, depending on the number of bedrooms in the home. Hot water, so uh, there's no restrictions on the fuel or the type of water heater. However, when modeling net zero, uh, heat pump water heaters uh, are, are pretty much necessary. Um, it's very difficult to get into net zero territory with our high base loads um, without actually uh, having that kind of efficiency in your water heater. So um, they should be coupled with, a, with the longest possible drain water heat recovery unit. And the drain water heat recovery is, is installed on a vertical stack. And the longer, the better. The longer they are, the more efficient they are. Um, and it should be um, you know, nearby, uh, fairly close to your tank. Another option for net zero is to couple your domestic hot water with your main heat pump system which is uh, common with ground source heat pump systems. And we may be seeing more of that with air source heat pump uh, as well. Um, that's something that, uh, is, let's, uh, let's say it's developing technology at this point. Um, I'm, any questions or clarification? Oh yes, Greg, there is, the chat here has been jumping. Oh my God, okay. <laughs> I, Okay, I have to go back in time a little bit. Um, so, sorry, I'm just trying to figure out, there's been a lot of stuff going on in there. Okay, so this is going back quite a bit in your presentation. So one note on exceeding the code, the city will ask the technical backup if you don't follow a prescriptive option for the insulation. Okay. Then somebody else mentions that your CEA would be considered as a specialized consultant on your project. 
Um, Christopher says that they don't always use a CEA, but they run into trouble when they increase the CI and use the two by four framing. Just do that as a standard all the time, but I've had to get forms and calculations from the insulation manufacturer. Okay. Noted. Uh, and also, I wanted to just, uh, it seems the terminology for EAs has changed. It's REA now, Registered Energy Advisor rather than Certified. Um, just uh, as an FYI, um, from, from the Energy Advisor perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a comment that the city needs to catch up on bit better building practices. Um, and the, Christopher mentions that he's had a few arguments around vapor barriers. Oh, yes. Yes, for sure. Yeah, I can just imagine. Then there's also a question around what is the recommendation for zero or low heel roofs to avoid compression? Right. So the low heel roofs, uh, the way to, um, to uh, one way to approach it is to use insulation that has a higher R value per inch as you approach the eaves. Um, so, uh, so your, um, your cellulose, let's say it's about three and a half, um, R3.5 per inch. Uh, and then you could install, uh, well, often they use spray foam for this, but, uh, you can install board insulation. Uh, so you're getting R5 or R6 kind of in that range, uh, in the eaves. And so you could, um, you could have that approach. To, uh, to bump up the insulation in, in that area, even though the thickness, uh, even though the depth of the insulation is gonna be lower. Um, another approach that is used, although uh, it's gonna be a bigger process, is that you could jack up the entire roof uh, to raise the heel. Um, so, uh, but I, that, that's getting more into deep energy retrofits. Uh, so I, I think uh, by far the more economical process would be to use um, a higher uh, R value per inch uh, insulation at the perimeter of the, uh, along the eaves. Okay, then there's another question. Uh, what's the feeling on the old classic expanded polystyrene? Ah, okay, so uh, expanded polystyrene is, um, it is R4 per inch, more or less. Uh, it can be a little bit lower than that. Um, it is, there's nothing wrong with it per se. Um, it, it doesn't uh, act as effectively as an, as an air barrier. Uh, so there are some drawbacks to using it. Um, it will depend on the material. There's a lot of different kinds of uh, expanded polystyrene out there now. It, is, it has been and continues to be used quite a bit uh, for uh, applications like um, uh, uh, insulating foundations, for example. Uh, and uh, it, it, so there are various products uh, that are used um, like uh, a SIP, uh, a structurally insulated uh, uh, panels. Um, uh, structural insulated panels uh, often are, uh, that's the kind of material they use rather than extruded polystyrene. So it is used, and I and I think it it it, it will be a cheaper as a material and cheaper per R value. Um, but if you're putting on exterior uh, insulation, you might want to use um, something that has a higher R value because the the thickness ends up being a, a problem for fasteners and so on, potentially. Uh, so the, the the thinner it is, uh, the, the the thinner the layer is, the better. Uh, Christopher also asks, how does it compare to other vapor permeable options with regards to carbon? Ah, uh, regard, with regards to carbon, I can't answer that question. That's not my area of expertise right now. Um, I, I will, and it's something I'm curious about, but uh, I, I don't have an answer for you. Sorry. Okay, there may be. Okay, some uh, Christopher now comments. The EPS we use in is R10 in, sorry, I'm not very good with feet and inches, um, two and one eighth. I okay. like it since it's vapor permeable and we do the weather resistant barrier combined with the air barrier. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, that, that sounds about right. It, uh, some of them are slightly better than R4 per inch. 
Okay, then a um, couple of other comments. Slab insulation may be getting removed for retrofits due to associated costs, not confirmed yet. Not Sorry, sure. What's the question there? No, I, I, there, I think they're just comments. Okay, all right. Uh, not sure about EPS compared to other permeable options. Wood fiberboard is the best, but difficult to find in decent thicknesses unless you opt for a European import. Right. Okay. In a, in a high enough basement, it's not that hard to add R5 in a retrofit. The allowance should really be related to finish ceiling height so it doesn't cause a code violation. The okay. city does not consider it a retarder. They will expect a sealed VB, hence my arguments with them. Ceiling okay. height was another one of the key considerations. It is highly recommended to add the insulation on the slab if possible. The code allows retarder if the inboard outboard ratios are met. That's it. Okay. Well, well, thank you for those comments, everyone. Uh, we have 15 minutes or so, and, uh, and we have a seven minute video in there, but we are actually approaching the end here. So, and the video is coming up very soon. So let's uh, forge ahead, shall we? And I, I probably won't have time just to warn you I, to go through all three of my examples at the end, but we'll go through at least one of them. All right. Uh, I, I, I should have uh, mentioned that this is the first time this presentation is being given. So, uh, you know, we would probably tighten things up a bit in the future. All right. Uh, so just uh, this is by way of um, a refresher. Uh, the builder renovator is the uh, is actually the one who who ends up delivering uh, this this uh, program uh, under CHBA. Um, they have to have a, a membership training and license. They're responsible for complying with the builder renovator agreement. They have to meet the technical requirements, and they have to work with the EA and the service organization to get the labels for the home. Uh, in terms of a process summary, um, this just uh, goes step by step through and and shows you uh, you know all the steps as as we go along here. Um, basically, we we st we start from with the energy advisor getting involved in modeling from plans, and we work through to the energy advisor evaluating the home at the end um, and uh, and for verifying uh, and verifying compliance. And, uh, and just a note that the attestation is required from the builder for components that can't be verified by the EA. So uh, we have a video here. Uh, Vita, could you cue that up and we'll, uh, we'll give it a listen? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Just a sec. Okay. I think, I think we can skip that ad. Oh, is this the ad? Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> Hi, David Dodge here for Green Energy Futures. Welcome to part two in our smart home series on energy efficiency. Have you ever dreamed of living in a net zero home? A home that produces all of its own energy and has almost no utility bills. That dream may be closer than you think. You just might be living in your future net zero home. The cool part is you can renovate your existing home all the way to net zero now, or you can do it in stages as time and budget permits. It's really quite simple to do. You can just add some insulation, some solar panels, and you can have a home that doesn't require fossil fuels anymore. It's much more comfortable, costs you less to operate, and it's really a pretty good return on investment. After renovating buildings for 20 years, Peter got the idea of combining renovations with serious energy efficiency upgrades to earn a return on investment. Before he started Solar Homes, Inc., he took a course in energy retrofitting and then undertook a complete renovation of his 1980s home in Calgary, Alberta. There's lots of people in Alberta spending 50 or more thousand dollars on cosmetic upgrades to their buildings. Why not spend a little bit more, improve the building envelope, add insulation and air tightness, and 
better windows, add advanced mechanical systems and a solar PV system that will supply all the energy your home needs. That's called net zero and that will pay you back for the life of the building. The cool part is you can renovate your home all the way to net zero now or do it in stages over time as long as you have a long-term plan. Well, there's many different components to the net zero pathway. I would suggest you start with an energy model, which will give you an idea of what kind of R values you want to get out of your windows, your walls, and how all these different systems are going to come together. So perhaps you need to put an R20 on the outside of the building for walls, and you need a triple paned window. All these things can be done individually so that you don't have to bite off this massive capital cost right up front. Same with the furnace and the hot water tank. Those can be replaced as they expire and you don't necessarily have to do everything right up front. Let's unpack what Peter did to renovate to net zero in four easy steps. First up, insulation, siding, air sealing, and windows. So what we did is we removed the existing siding and we added four inches of EPS insulation to the outside of the building. We also added a liquid applied air barrier, which uh, is instead of using paper and it dramatically reduced the air tightness of the building. Um, this is an R16 added to a two by four wall for a total of approximately R28. Then we um, used a pretty high quality window. This is a triple pane by Lux. Um, beautiful window, very airtight, um, great performance. Next, Peter replaced his furnace with an electric air source heat pump, heating and cooling system. So once we've got that heat demand down to a manageable point, we're able to provide all that heating and cooling through a single electric unit, which is basically an air conditioning unit that runs both ways. It provides both heating and cooling. And what it does is it takes one unit of energy, sends a liquid outdoor, picks up a couple units of energy from outside and brings it back in. So it's actually about 250% efficient. Now, we also can see here that we have the natural gas completely disconnected from the building and um, we have no natural gas bill anymore. Inside, Peter added a heat recovery unit to provide plenty of fresh air to his airtight home. We have just a basic air handler, which is connected to the air source heat pump. So the air source heat pump springs in the heat and distributes it through this um, air handler, which was just plugged into all the existing ductwork that we had in the home prior to the renovation. We also have an air source heat pump hot water tank, which is a great little unit. It takes the heat from the ambient air in this room and puts it directly into the hot water. And there you have it. A standard home to net zero in a few easy steps. Peter summarizes. So what we did is we put an exterior insulation on the outside of the building, which also helped with the air tightness. We added a bunch of great windows, and then we changed all the mechanical components to electrical components instead of natural gas, disconnected the natural gas, and then we put the power plant up here. The solar array, 10 kilowatts, this will provide me all the power I need for the rest of my life. So let's break it down. What did it cost to take a 1980s home all the way to net zero? As long as you have good sun exposure, we put about 30 grand into our walls, about 20 grand into our windows, 15 grand into our mechanical, and another 30 into the solar PV array. Very simple as long as you have good solar exposure. You can do this all at once, or if you have an energy model and a plan, you can start with siding and insulation, add windows, replace your furnace, and then add solar, one project at a time. The key is, when you combine energy efficiency upgrades with your home renos, the whole thing can pay for itself if you plan it right. There's one other factor that may help you take the leap to a future with low or no utility bills. In today's market in Alberta, there's a bunch of incentives available from the province um, towards insulation, windows, solar panels, and there's almost 15 grand available to a home that's looking to renovate to net zero. Perhaps you can achieve that dream of achieving net zero right in your own home. Start by getting an energy model for your home, and then make sure that you work with someone who knows what they're doing. Then, kiss your utility bills goodbye, 
Want more details? Check out our blog, podcast, and photos at greenenergyfutures.ca. If you like this video, watch for Solar 101, part three in our smart home series. Be sure to subscribe to our channel and check out our other videos. For Green Energy Futures, I'm David Dodge. Okay, Vita, that, that's good. Okay. Okay, so, so there uh, you can see what, what he did there. Um, he had an interesting approach uh, and uh, I mean, he's kind of in the business, uh, but uh, he, he did a lot of the things that we've been discussing. Uh, one thing that, we, that uh, I'm gonna talk about briefly um, is uh, the, the, the uh, I mean, he used the, the stepped retrofit approach. He started with his walls and he worked his way up from there. Uh, which wasn't, I mean, it wouldn't be so bad depending on the amount of time you take to, you do, uh, to, take to, you take to do the rentals. Um, and I, I, looking at his numbers there, it cost him 85K to do that, um, and of which 30K was the walls. And, uh, and but uh, he only paid, um, I think he said 15 for his, uh, for his heat pump system. So uh, anyway, uh, it's some interesting ideas there. And, and, and I just wanted to, to look at some, um, some ideas for um, retrofits here locally. Um, and uh, I'm not gonna, as I said, I'm not gonna have time to go through all of them, but uh, let's, let's have a look at uh, a couple of them. So first of all, uh, I've got a detached house here it was built in 2000. Um, it, it, um, it's 2,000 square feet on the main and second floors. Uh, is Greg? It, yeah. We can't, we can't see your screen. Okay. So, uh, Vita, can you... Um, oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. You just have to click on the share. Okay. Can you see it now? Nope. Oh, now? Yeah, yeah. It's starting. There we go. We're back in business, okay. Uh, I just wanted to make sure this is working. Okay, I think we're working now. Okay, um, so uh, you've uh, 2,000 square feet on main and second floors. It started with an R32 attic, R20 walls with vinyl siding or brick. In this case, it's, it's uh, vinyl on the sides and brick in the front. R12 foundation with gypsum, um, and it's a 3.8 air changes per hour at 50 pascals. It had a mid-efficiency gas furnace. Um, actually, in this case, had a con um, that's wrong. It had a, a condensing gas furnace, but a standard water heater and a 10 sear central AC. So uh, after this was modeled to, to reach net zero, uh, it, it wasn't done using all the CHBA rules, uh, so it wouldn't qualify uh, under the present program, but uh, nonetheless, uh, used a lot of the same approaches. Uh, so the attic was, uh, was it bumped up to R60. Uh, all windows were upgraded to triple pane fiberglass. The air leakage was, was dropped to 1.5. The HRV was installed. The air source heat pump was installed, but only 30,000 BTU was necessary after these upgrades. Uh, heat pump water heater was installed, uh, and there was an upgraded fridge and lighting. And then 650 square feet of solar panels. Uh, you, if you remember from yesterday, we talked about this as being kind of the maximum you can put in to put in a 10 kilowatt system. And note that in the video, that's actually what he put in as well. He put in a 10 kilowatt system. Uh, you know, talking about thresholds, uh, if you go beyond that threshold, uh, you, uh, you get into additional costs. So um, the, ER, the, the new ERS rating is 45 uh, gigajoules. Uh, so that's a, a, big, a big cut. And note, in this case, there was no added wall or foundation insulation. We just left the foundation insulation. There was no slab insulation added. So uh, it was still able to reach net zero. Um, so, and, and I've also worked out a couple of those for um, other situations. Uh, for a 1982 house, it did not require uh, wall insulation. 
and also for a 1965 bungalow um, where it, it, it had R8 balls. Um, and the advantage with the bungalow is that it does have a lot of roof space, so there's a lot of space to put in uh, a solar uh, PV system. So, um, and, and, you know, these are the other, uh, the other two houses here. Um, so, similar situation. Um, this one, uh, there was no added wall or slab insulation for the row house. And it, uh, it ended up being um, only uh, 34 gigajoules as a final rating. So a bit of a smaller uh, solar PV system used. A 65 bungalow, um, 1,500 square feet. It ended up being, um, uh, there was no wall insulation added to that and it was still able to reach net zero. Uh, so they, these can be done in a, on a slightly more economical basis than what we saw in the video there. So uh, that uh, we're up to the 130 mark, and um, so I want to thank you for your participation and your questions. Uh, please uh, send us uh, your. Uh, I will try to get back to you uh, with answers to your other questions. Uh, and um, uh, so thanks for participating in our series, and um, we welcome your input, and we welcome uh, working with you in future to 